The security situation in Pakistan is as volatile as ever. Peace efforts have again failed with the Taliban in an insurgency that has cost tens of thousands of lives. Imran Khan's party governs a restive province in the north of the country and has courted controversy in his efforts to find a peaceful end to this crisis. His detractors say he's soft on the Taliban. I'm joined by Imran Khan in the Global Conversation. Many thanks for joining us. My pleasure. There has been a military operation against the Taliban with the end of those peace efforts, marking an end to those peace efforts, when the Taliban admitted that they had killed 23 soldiers. Do you support the military in their strikes? I just need to correct two things. Number one, uh, if you are pro-peace and pro-dialogue, does not mean you're soft on Taliban because we have had military operations for nine and a half years. And all it has done is it's exacerbated the situation. From one Taliban group, we've got 50 Taliban groups now. So military operations have been a disaster for Pakistan. It's, it's only added to the insurgency, to the extremism. So you don't support this operation at the moment? But I believe that once the dialogue process was exhausted, then only should, should Operations must be a last resort. We've never had a, a proper dialogue in Pakistan ever between the political government and the Taliban. This was the first effort. And this was doomed for, to failure because um, there are about 50 Taliban groups. There are some groups not interested in peace. So the moment the peace talks started, these uh, uh, acts of terrorism escalated. So, so, so how so, can you negotiate with them then? How can you have these peace talks? Because the majority of the groups are interested in peace talks. So m the whole idea was to isolate the ones who are not interested in peace talks from the ones who are interested. If you have 50 groups, surely the war could be won if you can divide them and, uh, and isolate the real hardliners. At least get the large ones on, on your side. And there was every indication that some of the large groups were willing to talk. Now, we've asked our online audience to send us in questions, and we've had quite a big response. And we received this question from someone who goes by the name of Imran Khan. Imran Khan, 1984 to be exact. And he's asked, um, what is the red line that, when crossed, will result in your support for a military operation? When will you be satisfied that the peace talks have been exhausted? There is no military solution neither in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. In Pakistan, the majority of the groups are talking. So this process hasn't even started. There were only two uh, uh, parlays between the negotiators. And then these, uh, these uh, bomb uh, terrorist acts happened to sabotage these talks. Now, in my opinion, these people should have been isolated, the ones who sabotaged the talks. And there should, they should be an operation against them. But if, you go, if we go for a full-scale North Waziristan operation, there are 700,000 civilians that are uh, endangered. They're going to bomb them through air force, through helicopter gunships, artillery. Women and children are going to be killed. People will seek revenge. In my opinion, it will accentuate, exacerbate the situation. Why we will have you, more terrorism. Why didn't you take part in those talks? You had the opportunity to do so. This was also a question we received from Adil Ishak Abbasi, and he said, why did you keep yourself out of the dialogue? This would have added weight to the process. Uh, firstly, we already represented, my our party is represented in the talks, Rustam Shah Mohammad is... But I think the point that you have more weight is no. an important one. <laughs> no, no. Let me explain. The Taliban wanted me to represent them. How can I represent the Taliban? There are 50 groups. How can I vouch for them? So there was no question of me... Uh, uh, representing them. It wasn't a question that you were concerned about your image, about this, this fact that you're called Taliban Khan, that you weren't worried about that? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know them. I don't know what they stand for. So therefore, we had our representative in the committee. And actually, the talks were going well until uh, 
the one of the Taliban groups sabotaged them by killing these uh, soldiers. So should have they just have carried on? You think they should have just carried on regardless? Yeah, yes, isolate the groups that are not willing to talk. So why not go against those Taliban who were responsible, who took responsibility for the killing of the 23 soldiers? Why not go after them? Is that not what the military is doing at the moment? No, they're going into North Waziristan. This was done by the Moman Taliban, which is a different agency altogether. So they're already now bombing in North Waziristan, and my fear is that this will actually lead to more violence. Okay, you've also said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if the Pakistani government was to withdraw its support for the US war on terror, was to stop US drone strikes in Pakistan, then the Pakistan, the, the Pakistan Taliban would lose its momentum. Is that correct? The, the whole motivation behind this militancy was the U.S. Uh, invasion of Afghanistan. This militant started when Pakistan army, under pressure from the Americans, sent the, uh, 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 General Musharraf sent the Pakistan army into Waziristan. And the, everything started from there, the collateral damage, drone attacks, uh, the, the belief that the Pakistan army is fighting on behalf of the Americans, the jihad syndrome, the suicide bomber. So that's the motivation. Yeah, but you've said yourself the situation is far more complex than that. This is the Taliban that shot Malala in the head, the teenage girl who was trying to basically support kids trying to have an education, girl children have an education. They, want to, they do want to impose Sharia law. Certain groups do want to impose <laughs> look, Sharia law. Look, 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 first of all, they, nothing can justify the atrocities committed by the Taliban. Nothing can justify that. But let me just say one thing. Uh, in, the, in the negotiations so far, the moment the negotiations are within the constitution means that no one can impose their version of con uh, Sharia on Pakistan. And that's by, been my position throughout that in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, uh, the American withdrawal will calm things down in Afghanistan. And the moment the Pakistan army eventually pulls out, it'll bring things under control and the tribal people will then take over their area. Isn't that a little simplistic? It's, it, just, it just seems far too easy. It's the only solution. There, by the way, there are no simple solutions left. Everything now is complicated. There were easy solutions when there was only one Taliban group eight years back. There are 50 groups today. There's extremism have, has grown, sectarian uh, killing of Shias by these uh, extreme Sunni groups, that's grown. So Pakistan is more radicalized today than it was when yeah. we entered the war. So therefore, there are no easy solutions. But if there's massive collateral damage, you're pushing those people towards the, uh, the militancy. And that's why every military operation has added to the militants. You've been stopping uh, NATO trucks trying to get into Af Afghanistan in your protest against these drone attacks, the U.S. drone attacks. What are you trying to achieve by that? Because but the U.S. is withdrawing from Afghanistan. But, no, but the, the point about drone attacks is that it it is counterproductive. All drone attacks do is they increase militancy and the area which my party governs, uh, the, the Pakhtunkhwa province, three sides is the tribal area. So it bears the brunt of uh, the, the revenge attacks from drones. And so therefore, this was the resolution passed by the parliament, by all the parties, by the federal parliament and the provincial parliament. And the high court of Peshawar High Court has said that drones are crime against humanity. The UN res resolution has been against drone attacks. Amnesty International has called them drones as, as, as crimes against humanity. So therefore, uh, this is a protest against drone attacks. All the Americans have to say is that we will cease drone attacks. Even during the duration of the talks, we will uh, remove the blockade. Okay. We received this question from Carrie Maché, and, uh, who asks, have you considered taking the U.S. and NATO to court uh, and sue them for economic loss, but also imagine here, you know, loss of life? Uh, no, I haven't considered that, but I mean, all of us, uh, people in Pakistan are sinking under the war of terrorism. The country has lost over $100 billion in nine years. The rupee has gone from 60 rupees to a dollar to 109 rupees to a dollar. Uh, our, our total debt has gone up three times from about 4.5 trillion to 15 trillion, the total debt of the country in this time. Poverty has grown this, uh, the, in the province which our government has. 70% of, in, of the industry is closed. Uh, uh, there's, the only business growing is kidnapping for ransom because there's massive unemployment. So we desperately need peace there. And peace is not going to come by keep bombing people and 
killing the women and children and turning them into militants. How worried should we be here of kind of Pakistani militants coming over here to Europe, to Western countries, and fighting the jihad on our territory? So far, uh, and we are talking now about the tribal belt of Pakistan where this is going on, there is no tribal Pashtun who has ever been involved in international terrorism, neither the Afghanistan side nor the Pakistan side. At the moment, they seek revenge from Pakistani security forces. But, you know, if this goes on, uh, the, the, the failed bomber in Times Square, he quoted that it was the drones that were killing women and children. That's why he was uh, seeking revenge by killing civilians in the U.S. This war on terror has created more terrorists and more militancy. It's time to find a peaceful solution. We touched on this a few moments ago, but I'm just going to go back to this issue of concerns over Sharia in Pakistan. And this is a question, what's your commitment to secular principles in Pakistan? Look, the, the commitment is to the Pakistani constitution. So every political government which has come in has endorsed the Pakistani constitution. So anything out of the constitution, and th that means that no group can impose their particular form of Sharia on Pakistan through bayonets or through the barrel of a gun. It can't happen. The Constitution, if, if I want my form of Sharia, I have to fight contest elections on that manifesto. And then if people give me votes, then I go to the parliament and, and say that these are the... So personally? So, so therefore, my loyalty is to the Constitution of Pakistan. And therefore, uh, this idea that, you know, Taliban will impose their form of Sharia is just a myth now because they've accepted the Constitution of Pakistan. So there, that means their form of Sharia cannot be imposed in Pakistan. Okay, hardline attitudes are taking hold in Pakistan and that you agree with, I believe, and in the province you govern. And we were talking about Malala, and when she, well, not when she, when her book was to be published in your province, that was blocked. This is not true. Uh, it was allowed. There was a problem of uh, uh, the, um, she wanted to uh, launch the book in a university. There was just a problem about that. There was no question of blocking a book, and she was allowed to do that. Her book isn't available in the province you govern. It's not true. This is just a, a myth. The book is, it was only the, uh, uh, in the university they denied her. But they immediately said that she can launch it anywhere in the province. Would you invite her? Of, listen, I, I was the first one, when Malala was shot, I was the only political leader to go to the hospital and, and visit her. I mean, I couldn't visit her because she was at that time in intensive care. So let's just get this right. I mean, in our province, we are spending more money on education and female education than any other province. So, you know, this idea that somehow, uh, because you oppose this uh, military operations is, means you're pro-Taliban or extremist, this is just a propaganda that's going on. Cricket is probably as corrupt as politics is in many situations. What has your cricketing career brought to you in politics? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, cricket cannot compare to the corruption in politics. The lesson learned from cricket was uh, that you only lose when you give up. So in cricket, I used to fight to the last ball. In politics, I persisted. A lot of setbacks, uh, a long struggle. but. Uh, you know, the principle is that, you know, uh, as long as you keep learning from your mistakes and you don't accept defeat, eventually you will win. Your life must be pretty stressful. Do you ever have time to get your cricket bat out and play with your friends? <laughs> no. no, when I left cricket, it was goodbye forever. It was, the chapter was closed. I don't play at all now. Once I left cricket, that was the end of my cricketing life. And so you've, you've got strong support in your country, and I think you've probably got quite a massive female fan club, looking at the tweets I received. Um, this is my final question. And um, this is from Sana Imranist, and to end on a lighter note. And she says, ask him how he manages to be so awesome, and will he ever marry again? If I was younger, maybe I would have made a, said, yes, I will marry, you know, in a year or so. But when you get to my age, you realize that you plan your life in one direction, and life takes you in another direction. So at the moment where I'm sitting, no, the answer is no, there's no marriage on the horizon. 
But then who knows about the future? Imran Khan, many thanks for joining us on the Global Conversation. Thank you.